Okay, turn over to Hebrews chapter 4. We stopped last time in chapter, or verse 11, I should say. And we were talking about, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. That when we talk about the creation account in Genesis, that God sat down, he rested, uh, because he was through with the creation. The only thing new that is being created today is souls being saved. Amen. Because once we're saved, we are a new creature. By nature of the meaning of the word there, creature is a part of creation. We have a new creation versus what we had before we were saved. And so we look at these different types of rest that uh, Hebrews is uh, pointing out to us. And now he's kind of settled uh, on two, contrasting them back and forth. The one being the heavenly rest who comes from salvation. The other being uh, what theologians for decades, if not generations, have called the Canaan rest because it refers to uh, the uh, wandering of the Jews in the wilderness uh, headed towards Canaan or the promised land. We might just call it God's will for our life today in the New Testament era. Um, I have repeatedly said, I want to live my life in the will of God and uh, whatever that might be. Uh, and there's going to be times that uh, God's going to ask us to do something that we don't want to do. And this might sound ridiculous, uh, but I, I, I am fairly uh, agile for my age, I'm told, by my doctor, uh, but still I can't lean, I can't get out on my knees on a hard floor for very long. And I've been in men's prayer groups, particularly in Gulfport. Uh, if I can't get to, I usually try to get to the pastor's office when we have the men's prayer meeting. Uh, he has a little circle of chairs and he's very conscious of the older members in the church, particularly the Beams missionaries. Uh, he's, in fact, he's a little bit biased, I think. Uh, but anyway, uh, if I can get there enough time, he'll, he'll say, you know, sit here and I got this nice comfy chair and I'm on a carpet and no, no big problem. But if I get stopped and somebody wants to talk, uh, uh, sometimes I get in there when the room's full and I got to sit on the outskirts, which I don't mind that, but getting down on that hard floor and you got 20, my 20 to 25 men in there and every one of them pray like they're the only one praying, you're on your knees for a while. And uh, that's difficult on me physically. And my, actually my, my knees and my legs go to sleep. And I don't want to draw attention to myself. So I try to shift around and do things with that, that I'm not going to draw attention and not going to interrupt the prayers that are going on. But I say that to say that it's God's will. And I'm going to get to this in a moment. When verse 7 it says, let us labor, therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall under the same example of unbelief. Again, this is referring to the Canaan rest. They didn't achieve the promised land because they didn't believe that God could do what he could do. If you stop and think, as I mentioned last time, all of the miracles beginning from the Passover to God leading them out to the Red Sea and, and parting the Red Sea, leading them across the Red Sea, giving them manna from heaven, giving them quail from heaven, giving them water out of rock, uh, over and over and over again. Then when it comes time to go into the promised land, they say, oh, no, we can't do it. They didn't believe God. Well, God tells us there's going to be a little labor. You see, in, the, in the, the Jews' case, they were going to have to go fight giants. That's labor. That's labor. We can have this rest of knowing we're in God's will, which is the best way I know how to describe it. If we accept the fact that if we're going to serve God, sometimes it's going to be laborious. It's going to be going to be labor. 
The best illustration I can think of is that when we came to Dallas uh, the first time in 1976 and uh, wasn't long, uh, we met uh, a guy by the name of Charles Troll, Charlotte's daddy, and he was over the buses. And he said, can you drive a bus? I said, sure. He said, can you work on a bus? I said, yeah, it's got an engine in it. If it's gas, diesel, I don't know anything about, but gasoline engines I know a little bit about. He said, well, would you, you help me with the bus ministry? And I said, sure. And so I started uh, the bus ministry and uh, he gave me one of the larger buses. It was a 60 passenger bus. And he said, uh, here's where I suggest you go. And he took, got out a map and he told me it was about 25, 30 minutes from the church. And uh, he said, you can go over there and he rattled off a whole bunch of streets. And I said, well, I said, you don't have to tell me about Oak Cliff. I said, I was born, raised over there in Oak Cliff, raised till I was about three anyway. And I went back a number of times in visiting relatives. So I'm very familiar with the Oak Cliff area. And he said, good. He says, that is your Jerusalem. Go over there and start a bus route. So I went over there and started a bus route. I'd leave the church every Sunday morning about seven o'clock and I would uh, pick up my first uh, kid about quarter to eight, roughly. And uh, I started in Oak Cliff, and by the time, uh, three years later, when we were getting transferred, uh, the route went all the way over to Fair Park and then made a big circle coming back, and I was running about 75, 80 kids on a 60-passenger bus, and uh, God was blessing. But I would work from seven o'clock in the morning and I'd get back to the church about, it started at 9.45 and it, I couldn't get there at 9.45, just couldn't do it. Uh, it was about 10 usually when I got there. And uh, then of course, after services, uh, you know, I had to take a head count and light them all up. Sometimes I had to put a guard on the door and go find who was missing and, and it took a while to get them all in there and then, then go drop them off. And I always made sure that they went in their house. I didn't leave them out in the yard, didn't take them to, to Aunt, Aunt Josie's. I told the, the moms and dads, I said, if I pick them up at the house, that's where I'm gonna take them back. So I took them back home and get them all home. And it'd be three, between three and four o'clock when I got home and then Pat taught a, uh, a children's class at the church at six. So I got my Sunday afternoon lunch and basically uh, showered and, and got dressed again and went back to church. I used to joke about uh, uh, going back to work Monday morning to look forward to just so I could rest. <laughs> that was labor. But you know, the thrill of it all was at the end of the, the sermon and the beginning of the invitation time is when I lined up the kids that had gotten saved off of my bus that day. Fast forward in time, I, we're back here the second time in the early 90s and I retired in 1995 and then we started a Christian school and uh, would have been uh, September of 96 was our first school year. A young lady and a little six-year-old uh, boy came into uh, our building over there. I was out in the hallway and I asked her if I could help her and she said, I want to enroll my, my son in your, your school. And I said, uh, well, come on in. It was after, you know, the school had already let out, but there's still a few teachers there and our secretary was still there. So I took her in, into my office. We got all the papers and everything. And I had, in those days, I had pictures all over my office of the days of the bus route. And I had, you know, when we had big Sundays, my biggest uh, Sunday had 165 on that 63 passenger bus. Well, that's not telling, that's fibbing. They had to bring another bus out, two other buses, you know, to get enough kids so we could get them back for the big day that we we're having. And uh, she let out a holler. I had stepped out of the office and she let out a holler and she says, praise the Lord. And I went running back in there. I said, everything all right? And she says, that's my bus. And I said, I went over and I said, no, that's my bus. She says, you picked me up and brought me in here and I was saved here. That's why I'm here. I want my son to get saved. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. All that labor was worth it. If that's the only one, and it hasn't been the only one that the Lord has, has let me see, uh, it just reminds me over and over and over again of just the fact that uh, sometimes gaining that rest also, there's a little labor that comes along with it.
So we continue to look at this verse, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. Even uh, after re reading this, still some people will ask me, they'll say, well, Brother Don, really? You really believe that, that we have to work to get rest? Yep, you do. Another illustration, when we were in Germany, I was trying to finish up my bachelor's degree in the University of Maryland, so I took a lot of night classes and, and uh, several Saturday classes. I was blessed. The Munich campus was right across the parking lot from my office, so I didn't have very far to go to class. Uh, and that, that helped, but the classes, uh, the main campus was in Nuremberg, which was, well, it, I could drive it faster, but uh, wasn't always uh, convenient to do that. I'd take a five o'clock a.m. train uh, to Nuremberg, and then by the time I got a taxi over to where the campus was, uh, I'd be there by the time it started at eight o'clock. And uh, the professor that day, I took a history class. It was required for the bachelor's degree I was working on. And uh, he was a survivor of Auschwitz, which was one of the concentration camps. And uh, he said, because all of us are living in Germany, he says, my focus of this history class is gonna be on what did we learn from wars? What did we learn from wars? And then he went on and he kind of gave an overview of what the class was gonna be about and he contrasted the uh, uh, the understanding uh, that we all, there was basically he says, I would guess there's three groups of people in here and you're all gonna have slightly different understandings of wars. He says, there'll be those that'll be my age and you lived through the war, you're gonna have a, 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 a different understanding than those that were born through the war, which was me, versus those that are born after the war. And he contrasted that and he got near the end and he says, now, having said all of that, he said, how many of you have to come from outside of Nuremberg to come in here? And I was one of about a half a dozen that raised their hands. And he says, I'm gonna, I wanna make you, actually I'll offer it to the whole class. He says, you don't have to come and listen to me every Saturday for four hours if you write a paper. I want you to read three novels. One of them is War and Peace. If you ever read War and Peace, that by itself is a challenge. The other is, a, it's all quiet on the Western Front, and the third is the Tale of Two Cities. Now, when you read those books, write me a paper on what we've learned from the wars, and I will give you a grade for the class on that one paper. Well, there was a lot of scaredy cats in the class that said, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to put everything in one, one paper. I want to you know, have the opportunity to do different things and, and have my grade count. So, but I was one of the first ones that says, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> so uh, I went and uh, after uh, I wrote my paper, uh, I pointed out about five things that we learn from previous wars. Number one is that when nations disagree, if they do not find a middle ground to discuss their differences, history is taught that we'll go to war time and time again. If you have to reach, you have to reach a victory before you can have peace. Amen. If you do not achieve peace, you'll never, never have rest. And it's in my opinion, and I wrote, I, had, I gave him about a 30 page letter. It's more and more like a thesis. And I, I said that the best politicians I have seen in our history have been soldiers. And I still maintain that position. And then I said, in the end, if we do not reach out for God and labor to service God, we're simply gonna be following the will of mankind and we're gonna have a generation after generation after generation involved in wars. He took my paper and, and he kept reading it through the class. And uh, then he, he said, that's interesting, Mr. Smith. And I thought, here we go because I mentioned God. He says, I agree with everything you've said. He wrote a great big old A plus, 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 handed it back to me. Of course, A was all I could get, but it was encouraging to me at that time, that particular paper, but it's something I never forgot that if we want this arrest, this rest that God's talking about, we need to learn some things. 
we're going through a thing, a, a, a situation in our society today where there are those in, in our society that are trying to erase history. You can't erase history. You can tear down all the statues you want. You can even, as some, some educators have been doing, they're changing the textbooks and taking certain history out and adding other history, which is not history. You, you can do all of those things, but history is history. And if we're going to learn, we don't need to, if we, if we don't learn from history, we will repeat history. And so if we don't learn from history, we'll never receive this rest because we'll be repeating history again and again and again. It says that rest, let us labor therefore to enter into it. Looking back in mine and Pat's lives, we have, we have labored. Uh, it's been many times when we got in Sunday nights thinking, man, what a day. But then we would see how God worked and recognize that it's labor for him. For some Christians today, they just simply need to lay a hold of God and let God be that part of their lives that he wants to be. Because until we do that, we are in a battle today. We're in a battle today for freedom of religion. And we've been in that battle for decades now, and it's getting more severe, more, uh, more specific, and we're seeing more and more references to Scripture. As Brother Mark was talking about earlier. But then he says, lest, he says, we're to labor, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Now remember, he's talking to Jews that are very aware of what the Hebrews went through uh, in, in uh, wandering in the wilderness. And he said, if you don't want to fall in the same circumstance they fell into, then you need to get a hold of God. You need to get a hold of God. 20 years of my 35 year business career, I didn't have a voice in where they transferred us. Uh, they, they said uh, about every, we had our shortest trip was eight months, or our shortest transfer, I should say, was eight months. Had another one that was just a year. Uh, had one that was six years, and, and most of them, the average was about every two and a half years. Um, as my wife said, well, I got to take down and sell the curtains because we're going to buy new curtains when we get the new place. Uh, and that was just our life, the way uh, we, uh, we uh, viewed it and the way God worked in our life. And I didn't get a choice, but I prayed. I said, Lord, don't let him send me anywhere you don't want me to go. And even though we went to a few places and at first we thought, Lord, are you sure? <laughs> we found out later, yeah, God was sure. But probably the last transfer that we had that we didn't get a voice in was to Okinawa, Japan. I was excited about it. Uh, it was going to a part of the world we had never been, I had never been, and, and uh, I told, uh, told Pat about it, and, and, and she said, uh, what do we know about it? I said, well, it's an island in the middle of the Pacific, it's about 100 miles uh, from China, and uh, it's got a subtropical climate, um, you know, what else you want to know? And uh, I said, the military had been running the island for the last, uh, what, 35 years or something like that. And I said, they, about six months ago, they gave it back to Japan. And she said, I'm just not comfortable with this. And so we just kind of started praying. Our daughter came to us. She was nine at the time. And, and she said, Dad, she didn't say Dad. She said, Daddy, I don't want to go to Japan. They live in them paper houses over there. And they have big storms and it blows them paper houses down. I don't want to go there. Mark was four and he kept asking the question. His mama would say, see that airplane up there? And he said, uh-huh. He said, well, we're going to fly one of them over to Okinawa. And his question every time was, why can't daddy drive the car? So I wasn't getting a whole lot of support on this major transfer until we, ha we, had, we sold our house very quickly, which was an answer to prayer. Also encouraged me that God was in it. 
we one day we had uh, I had already cleared my office and brought everything home and uh, said the goodbyes and all of that sort of stuff and and they'd given us a, a going away uh, dinner and so on and so forth and uh, we had part of our furniture was on the van the moving van part of it was in the house part of it was out in the front yard packing it up getting it ready to go to a foreign land and I get a call from my old office saying you need to call Dallas and talk to them uh, they've asked you to call them, called and uh, talked to the director of personnel there. I thought, well, that's terrific. I got my furniture scattered all over the place, and I'm getting, I got to call the director of personnel. So anyway, I called him, and uh, he uh, tells me, he said, well, Don, uh, he said, uh, the brass have asked me to uh, switch your orders and send you to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, instead of Okinawa. What do you think about that? I said, I can't say it in public what I'm thinking about it right now. Uh, and he says, where are you in your move? And I told him, I said, part of my furniture is on the truck, part of it's in the front yard, and part of it's still in the house, and I've got a closing on the house tomorrow. I said, I've already cleared my, uh, you know, my office. I said, this is not the timing to you know, switch gears in this, ty in this type of circumstance. So what do you got against Missouri? I said, nothing. I don't have anything against Missouri. I said, if you'd have told me I was going to Missouri in the first place, I would have taken it probably better than we're taking this Okinawa thing. But that's, behi that's behind us. Now my family's have finally accepted it. We're going to go. And I said, that you asked me for my, uh, my decision, and that's my decision. I believe this is what God would have us to do. He said, good choice. Good choice. He says, that's what I thought you would say. But I had to ask you. From that point forward, they began to ask me. Now, what am I saying in all of this? It was easier, really, when they said, you're going to move here. Okay, it, God must be in it because I've asked him to be in it. And I, uh, I'm not sure what all this is about, but we'll go there. And we never, ever went anywhere that we didn't look back and see how God used us in a, in a specific way. But now, they're going to ask me what I think. That's a whole different world for us. And we began to pray, Lord, give us peace, give us rest to know when they ask us about going to a certain place that it is what and where you want us to be. Look at verse 12. It says, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You know, I've been bringing out, Paul uses certain select words like wherefore, therefore, and now he uses this word for. It's a little word, but at the same time, it points to a big meaning. Someone made the statement some time ago, and I don't remember who it was now, but uh, God swings big doors on little hinges. And this is what we're seeing here. This is one of those little hinges that a big door is hanging on it, and that's the Word of God. That's the Word of God, and he's describing what we should interpret from the Word of God. Now, we, we see here, there's some commentators, they seem to have a split uh, view of what we're talking about. We're talking about the Word of God. Some of them say, well, it's the written Word. Some of them say it's a living Word. I say it's both. He says, however, in Scripture, they'll say, well, in Scripture, the written word is called the living word, and, and, and all of that's true. But John 1.14 tells us the word was made flesh. Yeah. So it is the living word. Right. But it's also a living word in Scripture. It's a written word for us. Quick has the meaning of living, interestingly enough. So the word of God's living. Powerful in the Greek means energizing. So the Word of God is living and it energizes and is sharper than any two-edged sword. If you like to read or don't like to read, one of the, one of the books that I, I've read books that I think will help me to understand the Bible, and one of them was actually a series of books, is The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. Extraordinarily interesting book. Took me an entire year to read them, to read all the series. But I remember him talking in there about they, they had long swords 
and then they had short swords. And the soldiers that went into battle uh, would carry the, the short swords, and those short swords were double-edged. And the whole reason for them being double-edged is when they went like this, they were not wasting motion. They were cutting and stabbing, and the increased uh, probability that their enemy would be killed at that point. Then old theologians over the time have said that, well, it's a two-edged sword when you preach it because when you swing it out there to the congregation, it hits the congregation, but then when you come back with it, it hits you. And we've often said that, you know, nobody else might need this message, but I need it. And so uh, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectively worketh also in you that believe. You see, the Thessalonians received the word not just as an ordinary word, but as the word of God as the Word of God. Paul said later, or actually he said it in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, he says, My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. You know, I've never met a Christian that is faithful to reading and studying God's Word. Uh, now, that, this is key, what I'm about to say. Faithful, to reading and studying God's Word that was not happy with their faith. I'm not saying they're, they're not wrought with problems. It rains on the just and unjust. I'm not saying they may not be facing health issues or any, any of those things. I'm, I'm saying that if, they, if we study God's Word and we're faithful to read it, then we'll be happy in our faith. This is the rest that God is describing for us. When, uh, let, me, let me explain it this way. Sadly, many Christians do not believe they have the time to devote to read and study God's Word. Uh, son, and they'll be very faithful. They'll be here every time doors open, but they just feel like because of their life, because of their job, because of their, uh, their circumstances. They just don't have the time to do it. That's their decision. Some pastors I've met have told me the same thing. They've asked me, so they, they look at, I'll go and I'll preach for them and make all these references and, and I'll talk about old, old books of, of uh, Gill and and, uh, and others that uh, are out there and they say, uh, man, I wish I had the time to do what you do, but I have to work. So they, they're by, what we call bivocational. I've had many people ask me, so well, what does that mean? I said, what it means is that he has a full-time job just like you do. Plus, he'll, he'll work 40 to 60 hours, full-time job like you, Plus, he'll spend another 20 to 30 hours per week managing the church affairs to include preparing up to three messages per week. Because the church cannot or will not pay him enough salary that he can support his family. So how does God deal with all that? He deals with all of it individually. And, and in his own way. When I was a, a pastor, I had a goal to go through the Bible book by book with uh, both Landmark and with uh, uh, Garrett. When I was with uh, Brother Clyde, briefly before he stepped down and then Russell Jones took the place, we had started, I say we, it was Brother Clyde's idea of a series of what he called Route 66. I don't know if it was original or not. But he, what he wanted to do, and he was going to use the whole staff, all of us participated in this, and every Sunday night, one of us preached an a overview of whatever book that we were given to preach. 
And in 66 weeks, we went completely through from Genesis to Revelation, the entire Bible, in overview form. And we found that at the end of that, uh, Brother Clyde was asking me, he said, well, what do you think? And I said, I don't know if anybody else got anything out of it, but I, I was immensely blessed. I learned things that I thought I knew that I didn't know. What I'm saying is that this is a part of that rest. This is a part of that labor. If the Israelites had spent more time with God and less time on what they weren't getting in the world, they might have gone on, had the faith to go on into the promised land. And if we would uh, somehow, some way, and I've often said it only takes 15 minutes a day. Just 15 minutes a day. Will that lead to more time? Yeah, it will. If, you, if, if God gets a hold of you, it'll lead to more time. But uh, for years, I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning when I was working, and I'd spend about 30 minutes reading my Bible and studying. Because I always, always taught a, a Sunday school or adult Bible study or something. And, uh, and it became a part of my daily morning routine. And that's what God wants from us is it to be a part of our daily routine. Well, some people say, well, I'm not a morning person. I can't do that in the morning. Well, I'm just the opposite of that. I'm not a night person. I can't concentrate as well at night as I can first thing in the morning. So it says, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit. I get a lot of questions about, well, what's the difference between soul and spirit? The best way I know how to describe it is that we're all born with a soul. When we die, that soul leaves the body. And it goes one of two places. It either goes to hell or it goes to heaven. Are you with me? The spirit is the Holy Spirit that comes into your being when you receive Christ as your Savior. And I'm, I'm putting this in Texan here. And the soul and the spirit become comrades within you. Does that make sense? Am I making sense with that? And having said that, God says dividing, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, sometimes we, we get focused on things that, that God's not ready for us to learn yet, and this might be one of them for some of us, he says he can divide the soul and spirit, but nowhere in Scripture does he tell us that we can. We just need to trust him. We just need to trust him. Of the joints in the marrow tell us it's, you know, we have the technology today that we can get a full body scan, and, and I, I've seen some of the, the full body scans, and it's amazing, you know, what it shows, you know, of the body. But uh, we haven't always had that in my generation, but now we do. But even then, uh, without that scan, you and I can't see the joints in the marrow. But God can. I've said many times as we've been going through this series that uh, uh, God can uh, see everything about us. Goes on to say, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That Greek word for discerner is critic. You see, the Word of God is the critic of mankind, if I can say it that way. Uh, it criticizes you and me. It points out, by that, I'm saying that, it points out those areas of our life that we should not be involved in. Christ said it this way, he says, For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murderers, adulterers, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. And one time I preached on this, and a man came up to me and said, Well, you're that New Testament guy. I said, well, let me show you Jeremiah 17, 9. He says, the heart is deceitfully above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Oh, he says. So since the Old Testament down through the New Testament, God has warned us about this heart of ours in the terms of wanting to shift to the world, to follow the world, to be what, what's going on in the world. Who can know it, it says. God can. God can know it. Verse 13. 
we'll stop with 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Again, I've repeated this many times that God knows all things about us. I've actually had people say, well, you know, this, this such and such is going on in my life. Do you think I ought to tell God about it? I said, it really doesn't matter. God already knows about it. Well, I ain't told him anything. How can he know about it? Did you tell him? I said, I don't have to tell him. I said, God knows already. Does he want you to tell him, talk to him about it? Yeah, he does. You may as well tell him because he knows already. Next time we're going to look at the Christ is supreme to the priests. We've looked at him being supreme to the traditions, to the ceremonies, to the sacrifices, to the offerings, to the prophets, to the angels, to, the, to Moses, to Joshua. And now we're going to see he's supreme uh, to the priest. And we'll probably the bulk of this, the remainder of the chapter starting here in this verse 14, or starting in verse 14 through verse 28 of chapter 7, I think it is, is, is going to be focused on uh, Christ as our great high priest. And remember I said priest goes, priest and apostle go in two different directions, but scripture we've learned now in Hebrews is that Christ was both an apostle and a priest. But he's our high priest, and we'll see what God has to say about that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for...